Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to Tuesday night prayer. Mm -hmm. um, just going to do a bit about the foundation of what powerful prayer is. Oh, mm. And it's fellowship, actually. Mm. That's what Lynn Hammond says. Um, 2 Timothy 1.12 says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him unto him against that day. Um, actually, this is not the right thing I'm doing. Oh, no. um, anyway, we're going to have to sort of, this isn't what I wanted, but we'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I grabbed the wrong page. Um, okay, oh. so I'm going to read this. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. She says, judging from appearances, it seems like the church is doing great prayer, right? She said, you go into churches and you see that there's prayer requests, there's prayer, people are asking for prayer, people are saying to each other, brother, will you pray for me? Sister, will you pray for me? And, and they pray. And she said, there's prayer luncheons everywhere. She said, most churches you go into, there's a lot going on about prayer. And she said, usually you hear about prayer two or three times in a first in a church service, people pray, and she said, um, "One would think that talking about prayer, that the windows of heaven should be opened on the church, <coughs> and the blessings of God come upon us, which they are." But she said that um, we should be swimming in waves of revival, prosperity, healing, and miracles. And but she said sometimes. The church, she said, but clearly it's not the case that's happening. She said, we've seen some results of praying. She said, there's been glimmers and even lightning strikes of power during our prayer services or during prayer. Um, there's been people praying and congregations praying. And she said, they've even moved mountains with their prayers. But she said, we must admit in our day that church has not seen experience what the, uh, the, the book of Acts talked about, of building shaken and then how it was shaken when they came together and prayed. We've not been able to speak with absolute certainty what the words of the Apostle John when he said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that we have the petitions that are desired, that we desire of him. As a result, many Christians have allowed prayer to slip from their prayer priorities. It's, this survey says that there is less than most Christians, the average Christian invests less, less than two minutes a day in prayer. That's the that's average. Many others have struggled through disappointments of unanswered prayer. They try to explain their lack of, of unanswered prayer. They say, well, perhaps it wasn't God's will at this time, right? Um, but I believe every true Christian knows deep in his heart that despite what the theologians say, our problem is not God is saying no. It's that our prayers lack the depth that heaven requires. That's right. They seem to come from the head and not the heart. Instead of being propelled from our spirits, Lord God, they wobble from our lips, and they fall helplessly to the floor. Now, that's not everybody, but that, that's the average. That's the average person. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. I mean, we all have to be honest. There's prayers that we have prayed that we haven't got answered, right? And sometimes, I mean, most times, I'm speaking for me, that you wonder why. What am I doing wrong? What? Why? And and so she's just giving a bit of insight as to why people aren't seeing because a lot of times it's from our head and not our heart. Um, in times past, we were fooled by the form. And um, like a shopper standing in a shopping mall or in a store, out of the corner of the eye, you see a mannequin and you think it's a real person. And you speak to that real person. But pray, pray 
praise God, we're not being fooled anymore. We've looked that prayer mannequin square in the face and said, you're not the real thing. We turned our faces toward God and we began crying out as the disciples did, Lord, teach us to pray. And he is answering, he is restoring, yes. and not just principles and mechanics, but the spirit of prayer. Yes, yes. he is. Yes, he is. She said, um, it is the spirit we most de desperately need, not the principles and the formulas. It's not formulas and principles, but we have to be focused on God himself. Yes. We have an unwittingly grieved we have unwittingly grieved his spirit by approaching him almost as if he were a machine. Yes. And sometimes that happens yeah. too. You go to him just like he's yeah. a machine and that he's gonna he's gonna deliver for us. We follow step by step formulas, systematically pushing scriptural buttons and spiritual leaders and thinking that we're gonna get answers to to our our prayers. Many of us have even recognized the truth that it takes faith to receive from God. Yes. So we've studied the Bible, we've confessed particular verses, we've memorized, um, yet too often instead of causing us to flourish in prayer and faith, it's left us dry and spiritless. You know, this is not uplifting, but she's just generally yes. talking why people are not receiving answers to prayer. Why is it that it's because we can't have real faith just by knowing the principles? We have to know the real person. We have to know the person behind those principles. And that's why the Apostle Paul, in his great statement, said, I know whom I have believed. And he was persuaded. Paul didn't say, I know what I believed. He said, he said I, didn't, I didn't know the principles and the steps. But he said, I know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Real praying comes from a heart hungry to know God. It comes when we cry out as David did in Psalm 42, as the heart pants and longs for water. I pant and long after you. My inner self thirsts for God, for the living God. Deep calls to roaring deep at the thunder of your water swing. Your breakers and your rolling waves have gone over me. When a person is hungry, the deepest part of the spirit begins to call out to God for something to fill that hunger. He might not even know what he's calling out for. God knows, and this cry touches the depths of his heart, and he begins to respond. If we want true power in prayer, we must cultivate that kind of hunger. We must let deep then is called to the deep within him. We must desire to know God with such an intensity that every other desire pales. The fact is, however, this kind of desperate desire doesn't grow in hearts that just simply go to church on Sundays or even a couple times a week. It doesn't come to those who fellowship with God only at public gatherings. Personal. It's a private, as you know, it, love affairs don't happen out in, in the public. They happen in private times. Daily communion with each other, daily communion with him, times of waiting before him and worshiping him it's, and waiting on him. It's, we can pray like Elijah, but, and Elijah had an intimate fellowship the Lord. If you live in me, abide virtually, united to me, and my words remain in you, you continue to live in your heart. The word ask in that verse that says, ask whatever you will, and it will shall, and it shall be done. That verse that uh, asked is, has a deeper meaning than what you think ask means. It implies you and God are so intertwined your life and his life so closely joined together that when you ask him something, it's not really you asking. He's asking too. So, that's the kind of ask, asking that the Old Testament prophet Elijah did. He 
she said, well, people will say, well, I can't pray like Elijah. But Elijah was a man just like us. He was um, a human being. He wasn't anything special. He had the same struggles, and he had the same weaknesses as we have. He's not set forth as an unusual fellow. He lived off in some spiritual sassafir. He's given to us as an inspiration and an example of our strength. Yet his prayers changed the course of nature. And they changed people and nations. They projected God in full force to the world. How was he able to do that? How did he boldly go before Ahab and say, um, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, according to my word. He didn't just meander over and say casually to King Ahab, I feel kind of impressed. <laughs> and the Lord says it's not going to rain for a while. He was firm and he was clear. And that's how it's going to be. End of conversation. And sometimes we just fumble around and we say, well, Lord, if you will. And, you know, like, but he had an intimate relationship, and um, I wish people had told me years and years and years ago when I was little, um, growing up, that it was all about like an intimate relationship with the Lord. I, you don't know those things when, at first, but I wish if you knew that stuff at the very first, because um, anyway, but I'm learning. Um, he reveals a reason for his confidence that secret praying with the Lord, the secret times he stood in the power and the presence of God. He didn't just didn't make up those words. They were words that God gave him, he said. He received them from God himself. Elijah had come again and again before him in prayer, and because he stood in that place, he could speak and pray with world-shaking authority. You and I have a greater covenant than Elijah had. Right? Oh, yeah. Through the precious blood of Jesus, yeah. there's a new and living way that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. He's given us freedom of access that the Old Testament saints did never, they never knew. He's made available to us all the resources and power of heaven. But what have we done with these resources a lot of times? For the most part, we've done very little. We've been busy making a living, watching TV, or even perhaps participating in churches. And we haven't taken advantage of what we've been given. As a church, we pacified our spiritual hunger with the junk food that the world's offering us. And we've left the duck we left the dust collect on our Bibles and the cobwebs grow in our prayer closets. Right now you may be thinking, Yes, it's true, I've done that. How what do I do about that? She said Repent before God. You honestly acknowledge that you have desired other things more than Him, and He'll He'll forgive us, right? All the time. You cannot pretend to be hungry when you're not, but you can begin to call out to Him and say, "Lord, please forgive me and make me hungry for You." You can, from this day on, say, as David said, "Your face, Lord, I will seek." Set a time aside to fellowship with Him. And in the word, and not out of a sense of religious duty, but because you want to whet your spiritual appetite and you know the fragrance of his presence as you meet him daily. It will awaken the craving that sleeps with every true child of God. That's within every one of us. He's placed that within us, that hunger and that thirst for him, that craving for him. And as we spend time with him and ask him to help us, we, we, it will happen. It will remind you of how empty you are without him and cause you to cry out from the depths of your soul, Lord, I want to know you. In the natural course of the earth, whenever there's a vacuum, that vacuum causes air to rush in and fill the emptiness. Thus the wind blows. The same is true in the spirit. We empty ourselves of the distractions and desires of the world and 
afraid Jesus alone, he will rush into our lives with the wick of the Holy Ghost. And he'll meet us with an intensity and an outpouring we have until now only read about. We will know not just the form of prayer, but its power. There was something that I found in this book of Tim Sheets that I found interesting. He decrees uh, from Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And um, he said, he personalizes it, and uh, he said, but when you put that into a decree form, it starts to transform your life, and it feeds you in a different way. So he said, when I put it in the decree form after reading it, it sounds something like this. King Jesus is my shepherd, and I don't want for anything. I want for nothing, and I will never want for anything, because my King Jesus is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in places of great resources that will only feed my life. That will happen to me this day. He leads me beside the still waters. He will never lead me into troubling places. He leads me to restful places and he restores my soul. No matter what comes to deplete me, my king will be there to restore and life me afresh and new. He will lead me in great paths today, paths of righteousness. Right ways will be before me and I will be led down the right path. Even if I walk through the valley of death, I fear no evil. I will not fear evil. I don't have to fear any kind of evil, because he's always with me. I fear no evil. His rod, his staff, they are always there to comfort me. Even if I come into the presence of my enemies, I will have nothing to fear, because he will spread a banquet for me. He will resource me, Anyway, no matter what situation I find myself in. He anoints me with fresh oil. My cup is going to run over. The anointing of the kingdom of God is overflowing and running through my life. Goodness is following me everywhere I go. Mercy is following me everywhere I go. Favor is following me everywhere, everywhere I go. And it will be that way all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because I am a part of his family. I am a son or daughter of God. I have the right to be in his house. His presence is where I live because I live in his presence. Only good will comes to my life. Anyway, I found that interesting. Yeah, 